how to catch redfish or really just inshore slams in general in a brand new city or even a brand new state, some area that you are not familiar with whatsoever. If that interests you, if you want to have the confidence to be able to go to some brand new area and actually catch fish almost on demand, then you are going to love this episode. So what we did is we teamed up with John Skinner. John Skinner has a massive YouTube following. Obviously, a lot of his stuff is with Fluke and with Stripers. And he does some really amazing stuff from New York and up in North Northeast. And we did a couple of mastery courses with him. And, and part of his last mastery course John came down with bucktails and some other lures that he uses up there and started absolutely killing it down here in Florida and I the one video he caught like 11 species in one day using some very similar techniques that he uses up there but also combined with what he's learning down here and I talked with John I was like man it would be so helpful if you could share everything you learned even the bad stuff because he had some really frustrating times as well to begin but once he dialed in it was like a light bulb clicked off and so he shares all that including the bad stuff which I really appreciate him doing and then also he shares all the tips the tactics exactly what's he what he's looking for what some of the similarities some of the differences and exactly how you can dial in a new area so once again in his case it was going from New York and New Jersey and areas like that all the way down here to Florida, which obviously everything looks differently. And even the fishing's different, right? There's a lot of live bait fishing, whereas up there, it's a whole lot more of using artificial lures. The cool thing, I think, is that a guy that, you know, does not live here, he was doing this on vacation. Now he has, you know, a part-time uh, house here as he's uh, getting closer and closer to retiring. But at the time when he first started coming here to dial this in, he was a vacationer and he was having to figure it out all by himself using artificial lures. So listen, and this is John's kind of story, along with some really cool footage of him actually fishing real spots in Florida and trying to figure this out. I believe if you're trying to catch redfish, tarpon, speckled trout, snook, I mean, some group recalls all kinds of fish in this. If you're trying to catch those in new areas, especially right here in the summertime on vacation, this is gonna be incredibly helpful. John, thank you so much. Here he is. This is John Skinner doing a video for Salt Strong, and you can check out my online fishing courses and get significant discounts at saltstrong.com slash Skinner. Full size. Holy smokes. So, you know, I think most of us as fishermen at some point in our lives are faced with a situation where we have to learn a new fishery. And hey, if you're new to fishing, well, then certainly you're learning something new. Uh, so I was faced with this when uh, I started wintering in Florida in February of 2020. Um, Clueless, absolutely, God, almost no man. idea what I was doing. Um, and you know what? I became successful very quickly, and uh, you know, there's a lot of research that went into it. But also, what was really important was that um, being a very experienced Damn. fisherman up north, I was able to leverage a lot of the things I learned and knew about fishing up north, apply those to the southern waters, and, and the results were just, I think, nothing short of stunning. Um, so that's what this video is about, is, uh, you, you know, if you're yes. changing fisheries or you, you're going into a new fishery, um, you know, don't throw away what you know. And uh, I'm going to go about here, you know, just actually starting from um, the first time I pedaled my kayak out into Pine Island Sound. Fortunately, I was recording uh, what my thoughts were and how I was going about it. And, you know, we're going to start with that, that you know, first trip pedaling out there and, uh, and see how that goes. And um, we're going to start hitting all these things that you need to think about when you get to a new fishery. So this is about as clueless as I've ever felt. Here's a whole bunch of keys, little islands. Um, I don't know their names. Uh, I don't have a Navionics chip for this area yet, just an oversight. So I'm really kind of blind. So look, all I can think of is I just saw a, a boat, like, you know, a 23 footer or something, pass between me and that island in front of me. So therefore there's a channel. Uh, this is pushing well out into the sound a little bit. And I can only assume this current. And I think what interests me is that these two islands here, that narrow gap, 
I would think that's got to funnel water. So I would think it has to make current. So clearly there's mangroves. I mean, come on, the structure, miles and miles and miles of structure. So I'm just going to hope that I've got current running along structure and that there will be fish. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's going to take a lot to learn. So. so this actually looks pretty good. I mean, I don't know. I guess i got to get closer to tell, but there's definitely current here. So that was a good one. And the islands, they, they have to deflect current, so that's a good thing. And there's certainly the structure there. And I just hope that there's some water up against those mangroves. These pelicans are, you know, they have to eat. I hope that big boat's going somewhere else. I think he is. Which will also tell me there's a channel between those islands. Oh my god, how can there not be fish here? Holy crap. I got depth, I got current, I got mangroves, I've got birds. Um, wow. Alright, so here's the plan. I'm gonna start on this plank and work my way down. And then I have a lot more. Oh, I gotta shut this thing off. Okay, why did I do that? Let's freeze it there. It's because sonar makes some noise. Maybe the fish can pick up on it. And the point is, the southern shallow water fisheries, the fish are so much more spooky than they are up north. So that's a difference between the two fisheries that I have to be aware of. They are worried about being eaten by dolphins, by sharks. They're worried about stuff, pelicans hitting them from overhead. They get it from both directions and it's something you really have to think about in the shallow water southern fishery. That's something I always have to keep in mind. Then I have a lot more over there I can work. All right, so uh, that did not pan out. It looked great. Did not work. Couldn't raise anything. Tried about 20 minutes. Moving on. So the one thing I wasn't seeing down there was I um, didn't see any mullet jumping. And I could see them up this way. This is a couple hundred yards. Uh, what would be to my right, and uh, there's a little boil right there, so uh, I'm gonna, uh, try here. There's things on this that I'm spooking. Probably mullet. I don't know what they are. Oh, man. Just make some casts. It's a red. Holy smokes. Or is it a trout? It's a red. A red fish. Sweet. You're right, just a small one, but it's positive reinforcement. And think about what I was saying on the way out. Okay, I've got current. I've got some deeper water nearby. I've got structure. The pelicans. And then at some distance, a couple hundred yards, I was able to see some mullet jumping. So, you know, these are all these visual cues to get me over here to stop to make a cast, first cast, a redfish. And you could tell from my voice, I was pretty excited about that because, yeah, hey, you know, I'm, I'm onto something, maybe. All right, welcome to a well-stocked uh, Florida fishing shop. You're going to get blown away by the choices. I'm going to try and keep it to a minimum here. Jerk baits and spook plugs. And uh, part of the reason is that I have experience with those from the up north fishery. And uh, yeah, they're on a different size scale, but it's the same basic approach. And um, having that comfort level with the new lures will go a long way. Might as well use gulp for the jerk bait to start because it will give me that extra scent factor. Um, yeah, so you know, he, here you go. You, you saw me rigging that. Well, this is just a, a larger version of that. This is a sluggo on a swim bait hook. And I'm striper fishing, standing on a rock out in uh, Long Island Sound. Um, and you know what? So the experience that I gain working these big soft plastics transfers directly down to the Florida fishery. And even though most of the jerkbait offerings down in Florida are scaled down, uh, not all of them because I've taken the same large sluggos and there's a 10-inch hoagie floating in the water that took a big snook. 
and here's a dolphin chasing down fish on the flat. Wow. I have no idea whether that dolphin just wrecks the fishing for this whole area. Probably. Which figures because it's not like I know much else now. That's, could this be my snook? That was a perfect cast. It could be. No, it's a red. That's okay. He was really tight. Okay. Where is Mr. Dolphin? Mr. Dolphin's headed out. Get out of here, Flipper. Thank you. Gotta get those nice casts in there. So I don't know if it's obvious what happened, but that dolphin caused me to go in closer. And I just caught two reds right in there, right in tight. Just gotta make decent casts. That's where they are. Maybe they moved in because they heard the dolphin. I imagine they know when those things are around. Good thing is I don't hear the dolphin anymore, and I just caught a couple of fish, and I'm up to four reds in a trout, and it's pretty early. Oh, there's another one. You know, so I can try and be nice and quiet and not spook fish, but I have no control over dolphins, uh, but I can react to them, and I think I did that well there, and it's something that... Yeah, you know, you learn, and uh, certainly one of the factors in this kind of fishing. All right, something I like about using the jerk bait is that pretty much everything will hit them. So I don't feel like I'm canceling out one species or another by using them. Everything down here will hit them. Uh, so hey, here's a beautiful trout, and uh, yeah, it's a, a good catch. Really happy to get that. And by using a lure that catches pretty much everything, it's helping me learn where fish are um, you know the different species where they're hanging and uh, it was really educational on this trip because the trout were in a slightly different spot than the reds but since I was throwing a lure that catches them both I was able to, to figure that out. Oh, that is a beauty. Nice. If you look way down along the mangroves, um, it looks farther away than it is, so that there's a, a boat down there, uh, probably a guide boat. I can see he's kind of anchored with his push pole, and he's throwing stuff in the water. I can only assume he's chumming, um, and he just set up there. And Yeah, I'll just point that out now. I, I think that's going to have an impact on things, but uh, not yet. I saw him coming. <laughs> Now, if I was just to fish the way I see other boats fishing, how my neighbors fish, how just about everybody in this area fishes, I would be like throwing a cast net and using bait because for whatever reason, I don't know what that is. That seems, that is, it's like 95% of the people who are fishing here are using bait. Um, yeah, I, I knew it wasn't necessary. I mean, look, go on salt strung, you know, you'll, you'll see, you know, all, all the, the stuff on artificials. Um, but yeah, I, it's still, even after uh, a winter and a half of being down there, I, I've never wrapped my mind around why there's not more lure fishing. So sometimes when you go to a new area, you know, you have to do things on your own. So after that chumming boat was set up for about 20 minutes or so, um, this bite just died. And I, you know, I'm not going to say for sure that that's what killed it. I can just tell you that I, I lost the bite. Um, so what I did was move... Um, and as good as this trip's been, you know, I haven't had big stuff. Well, I'm going to get big stuff. All right, here's the plan. Uh, I'll fish another hour at most. I see all these, you know, current tides up kind of high. Not quite high yet. A lot of this um, vegetation overhanging here. So I'm going to focus on that. Try to get in there. I'm going to focus going in tight. Hopefully, you know, if I can get a snook, 
that would give me a slam and oh boy I have done I think I've got like 11 reds a couple really nice ones three trout come on just one snook but uh if I catch nothing on this next hour it was still really an unbelievable trip okay shoreline I've never seen before just you know like I said going in there uh, I like those overhangs gonna try and hit those pockets Only one I'm fishing. Ooh, this is the nicest one of the day. Glad I didn't take that call. Okay, bigger than anything else I've caught so far this trip, and uh, yeah, it's gonna go back and hit that spot. All right, so I took a wide swing with the kayak, went right back on the same spot. Um, gonna try it again. Another nice one. All right, same exact spot as the other one. Hey, you see that point in the background? I had been fishing just around the corner from that point, and you see I've got bigger fish on this side. So, uh, yeah, it pays to move around a little bit. So I hit that spot again and um, and didn't get anything, and I felt like maybe you know I had disturbed things in there pulling those two other fish out. So I went back around the corner, checked the original spot. There was a dolphin in there. I didn't do anything. Uh, so this is maybe 45 minutes later, came right back in here after giving it a rest. I would do the same thing in striper fishing. <laughs> the results are almost the same. It works. So great fishing, right? You know, you think I can just go back there now season after season and, and get in on those fish? No. Um, so you have to think about your environment and other factors in the environment and one of the big ones. Uh, in this region is red tide. Pine Island Sound had a lot of it over the 2021 winter. Um, right now as I'm recording this video I just generated this. Uh, Florida does a lot of sampling. They provide maps. This is the Tampa Bay area. Uh, those um, orange and red dots, those are very important. Those are medium and high concentrations. That stuff can kill fish but at the very least it will move them or make them lethargic. And I can tell you that the area where, you know, you just saw me catch all those redfish and everything, um, it was actually not very good um, in this preceding winter. What can you do about that? Well, you pay attention to these maps. You go where the red tide isn't. And, you know, for me, I ended up fishing uh, a little bit closer uh, to the mainland as opposed to the barrier islands. All right, you saw me do a lot with the jerkbait. Another lure that I depend on heavily in the southern environment is the spook. And, hey, I was familiar with that from striped bass fishing. Those are my striper plugs up top, those big ones. The bottom one is a Head and Super Spook Jr., a very productive lure down in the southern environment for snook, redfish, trout, numerous things. There's the striper plug coming in, that big, beautiful side-to-side -side action, leaves a wake on the surface. Uh, this thing is deadly for stripers. So having used these lures for stripers up north, it made me that much more comfortable applying them on the southern fishery. And holding that rod parallel to the water with those twitches, giving a little bit of slack in between each one, gives it that beautiful side-to-side -side motion. So it wasn't a huge leap to then do something very similar uh, with the seven-foot rods and the smaller spooks. All right, I'm going to use a Thanksgiving morning spook casting trip as the backdrop to discuss uh, a couple of real important things related to this shallow water. Uh, I mean, you've seen the, the previous clips there were shallow, and uh, yeah, this is too. And by shallow, it's very common that I'm in less than two and a half feet of water. I can tell you that uh, three feet is rather on the deep side for a lot of this fishing. Um, so yeah, one to two feet, pretty typical. So one of the things that um, works into this is, you know, and I'm thinking of this because I see this little breeze on the water, is the wind. Uh, we don't tend to get, at least in the two winters I've been down in southwest Florida, uh, I rarely see wind over 20 miles an hour. We just don't get a lot of it. But I can tell you just uh, if it blows 10 to 15 miles an hour, uh, it moves water. 
And if you're trying to target a current direction, you better make sure that the wind is not blowing against that current or else there's a good chance you're just not going to have any. Because when, the, when you're dealing with large expanses of water, I mean, I'm fishing in one to two feet of water. There's places that's got, that have less water than that. Um, and then, of course, there's some deeper channels. But for the most part, the water is shallow. The wind really moves it. So you have to consider that. Like this particular body of water, this is Pine Island Sound, it runs uh, north to south. And if we have a strong north wind and you want to fish incoming current inside of Pine Island Sound, well, you better pick your spots very carefully because uh, that wind is really going to hold it up. And it can go the other way as well. You know, when you've got wind going with the current direction, you're going to have increased current. So, yeah, maybe that's the time that you want to be fishing. And it's not just current. It's water levels. I mean, so if I'm here and it looks like it's about two feet of water, um, yeah, fine. I'll tell you what, though, if it's been blowing north for a couple of days or even one solid day, huh, there will hardly be enough water here to even get the kayak in here, no less have fish over it, uh, especially for boaters. It's a tremendous concern. Uh, prolonged stretches of northerly winds or easterly winds in this particular body of water. Now, that's going to vary. It's going to depend, you know, where are you? What are the winds um, that are going to push the water a certain way? Well, in this particular body of water, yeah, a couple of days of, uh, of north wind or one day of strong north, uh, that's going to just push the water out here. And, um, well, you have to plan for it. You know, if you're going to go out, you got to stick to your channels and you may be able to leverage that low water because if you think about it, well, it gives the fish less places to go. Um, so, but it's a, just a tremendous consideration that is not as big a deal up north in terms of water level and current speed. I mean, there is an impact, nothing like it is here. All right, up north, water temperatures change slowly. Here, oh, it's just completely drastic. You can go out one day and the following day there can be a 15 degree change in water temperature. I mean, it could be six or seven degree difference between whether you go in the morning or you go sometime in the afternoon. Uh, now on top of that, these fish are very temperature sensitive. The snook will actually start dying around 60 degrees. So when we get a couple of cold days and we do occasionally get them down in the 40s, uh, you can push these water temperatures down around that 60 degree mark, well you can bet those fish are not going to hang around and you know potentially get killed in that. They're going to move and they're going to move into some deeper waters where uh, there's some buffering and the water temperature is more stable. So that's the snook, but hey, the reds and the trout, they can tolerate that colder w water better and sheep's head thrive in it. So you know, that's another part of when you're moving into a new fishery is to just biologically understand the fish and uh, what temperatures they can they prefer, which ones they can't tolerate, and uh, that's a big game here, especially like I said with the shallow water, the water temperatures change very fast and the fish react to it. Hey, I mentioned you know a lure that catches all the species. Well, that's the spook. It does that, and uh, so there's a trout. So they would call that uh, a Southwest Florida slam, uh, getting the snook, trout, and redfish. All right, I keep calling it a spook. It's not actually a spook. It is a rebel jumping minnow. Uh, I actually came to Southwest Florida. I only had two spooks, lost them quickly, had this plug in the bag because it's a pretty popular northern striped bass lure, and wow, it just turned out for me to work better than the spook. I think it handles choppier water better. It kind of plows through it. The fish, um, when I was throwing it along with the spook, um, they just tend to hit that one better. So instead of using a, sp uh, a head and spook, which are very good plugs, um, I use the Rebel Jumpin' Minnow. All right, so we know tides and currents are really important in just about any saltwater fishery. Uh, going down to southwest Florida, if you would ask me if I understood tides, I, I would say, well, of course. All my life I've understood tides. You know, roughly six and a half hours apart, you know, Low, high, low, high, yeah, six and a half hours. I didn't understand anything about Gulf Tides. If you look at the left-hand side of this, that's a 17-hour incoming tide. It starts coming in around 2 a.m. It doesn't top out till 6 p.m., 16 hours, and better yet, in the middle, 
for a couple of hours, there's a dead spot. You go out fishing on that dead spot, I can just about assure you, you're not going to catch any snook, probably no redfish either. Up north, I can look at just plain old tie charts that give me the time of low and high water, um, but not here. Uh, you know, I need to look at these plots for every single trip um, to understand stuff like uh, the flat spot in the middle of the 17-hour incoming tide. I mean, if you're on the Gulf Coast, you're probably, yeah, that's the way it is, but uh, I can tell you in the Northeast, no, uh, it, you, you don't see anything like this, so it's another thing to learn about the environment that you're going to fish. All right, there's no lure more universal than a bucktail. And uh, so that's what I've got here, uh, three-quarter ounce. It's uh, actually one of my uh, John Skinner swing hook fluke bucktails, three-quarter ounce. I'll also use a one ounce tipped with a gulp grub. Um, that's going to catch pretty much uh, anything that's willing to hit an artificial. Okay, this is grouper fishing, and this is exactly like striper fishing over structure. All right, this is the spot right here, coming up on it. I saw the line get twitched. <sighs> Come on, right on the mark. Yeah, if this is in the Everglades, uh, there are rocks down there, so it's it's rocky structure and it's exactly striper fishing. I've got the um, the structure marked on the, the GPS on the plotter. You drift over that and boy, those fish are hanging so tight to the structure. You pretty much know when you're gonna get a hit. Uh, I can't imagine a better lure than a bucktail to do this. I really like this fishing because when it's when I'm down there, it reminds me of being up north uh, and the fish are so cool. These are Goliaths. Uh, not the big giant ones, but a really fun size for this tackle. And uh, they all have to be released, but that's just fine. Um, they are a load of fun. Boy, nothing hits a jig harder than these fish. Yeah, and my friend Elias turned me on to this. A lot of people are familiar with his YouTube channel. And, you know, his origins are up north as well. And uh, he told me, he said, hey, this is, uh, this is just like striper fishing. And uh, he couldn't have been more correct. So it's uh, just another example of stuff that you learn up in other fisheries really applies uh, in so many places and yeah when it comes to bucktail fishing uh, that's always the case all right uh, nice it's a heck of a start you know a lot of the gear from up north transfers down south this is the john skinner fluke rod and uh you know what it can bounce bucktails for groupers the same way it does for fluke and be just as effective. There we go. Ooh, that's a good one. You can just feel the tail pumps on that. Oh, I'm glad I've got this rod for this one. <laughs> mm. Let's pretend it's a doormat. Whoa. Okay, so now I'm using the trolling motor to create the perfect drift. So I'm just going very slowly into the wind, but with the current, about one mile an hour. It's exactly what I would be doing if I was fluke fishing or for the southern anglers, uh, flounder fishing. All right, so in the fluke fishery, uh, the, the drift is so important, and when you have wind against current, that's no good. I had that situation here. Use the trolling motor exactly like I would for fluking. Hey, it's combination fluking and striper fishing. Great results. Slow troll, just like fluking. <laughs>
Now that's a surprise. <laughs> well, I said I was fluke fishing. Uh, okay, so that's a gulf flounder. All right, I hope you enjoyed this, and I would encourage you to check out my John Skinner Fishing YouTube channel and my online fishing courses and discounts at saltstrong.com slash skinner. Pretty awesome stuff, right? John, thank you so much. That was incredibly helpful. If you guys have any questions, let us know down below. And of course, if you haven't joined us in our private Salt Strong Insider Club, we just hit 25,000 members just like you who want to constantly improve. Yes, even full-time guides want to constantly improve. Number two, we want to be around like-minded people who get us and who are willing to share what's working right now, real-time, on-demand. And then, of course, the tackle discounts. The tackle discounts bring in a lot of people, 20% or even more, on all of the rods, reels, line, lure, apparel, etc., in our store at fishstrong.com. So to join us, go to saltstrong.com. We have an unheard of 365-day, 100% money-back guarantee. So I hope you'll join us over there at saltstrong.com. We appreciate you. Talk to you guys on the next episode.